Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our second uh, spring online ag production training course. Uh, I'm Dr. Rick Maxwell. I'm the County Extension Agent for Agriculture Natural Resources here in uh, Collin County, and I'll be uh, bringing forth uh, this uh, second presentation in our online series. And our topic for today is uh, pond management. Uh, this is a question that uh, we get quite a few calls on uh, a lot of different areas when we talk about pond management. Uh, in our, our training, we're going to be discussing some of those uh, very relevant uh, uh, calls that, that I get about ponds uh, through our office. So we'll jump right into this. Uh, again, it's, it, our, our presentations are going to be rather brief, uh, but hopefully we'll give you a lot of good information uh, that you can... Uh, uh, gain from. Uh, the topics that we will be discuss discussing today uh, are pond design and construction, uh, something that's very, very crucial. Also, another is aquatic vegetation, identification and control, along with different fish species and their management uh, that we can utilize in our farm ponds uh, here in North Texas. Uh, so uh, anyway, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, pond design and construction first. There are uh, different reasons that uh, uh, we look at when we're thinking about building a, uh, a pond. Uh, one uh, that uh, is, is very prevalent is erosion control. Uh, one is for water, for our livestock that we have on our property. Another one might be irrigation purposes uh, for small acreage. And another is just recreation. And it could be one of these or all of these is your reasons for building a farm pond. Okay, uh, these next few slides have a lot of information on them. I won't specifically go over every little detail on these, uh, but I wanted to list them on the uh, presentation on these different slides uh, so that you could uh, write information down or refer back to the presentation uh, for specific areas and considerations that we look at when we're thinking about building a pond. Uh, site selection is, is crucial uh, for your pond. Um, you need to do preliminary studies uh, before a final design is, is determined. Uh, we need to look at a lot of different factors. Um, analysis and selection of pond sites should be based on your landscape. A lot of the ecological functions and values of your specific property uh, come into play. Uh, the relationship of the, the site to other ecological features within the landscape is critical also uh, to achieve planned objectives for your pond, whether it's the erosion control, livestock, water, recreation, whatever the case may be for you. And if possible, consider w more than one location and study each one to select the one that's the most appropriate for your site, the one that's the most uh, practical and has the most aesthetic uh, attributes. And then weighing both the on-site and off-site effects of constructing the pond is essential in site selection also. You not only have to be concerned about your particular piece of property, but also your neighbors that surround you. On pond constructions for economy, we need to locate the pond where the largest storage volume can be obtained with the least amount of earth fill. So we look at sites on, on a property where we have to move as little of soil as possible. We look at areas that might have a, uh, a, a ravine that's due to a, erosion, uh, a small ditch, uh, maybe where two slopes come together. But we're looking at areas where we have to move uh, the least amount of soil. Uh, this is going to help. Um, we want to avoid areas where shallow water uh, becomes excessive. Uh, so we look at really the runoff that's going to come into that pond also and how far it's going to back water up. If the farm pond is used for watering livestock, we need to make a pond that is available to those livestock in your different pasture grazing units. Uh, when we force livestock to have to travel a long way 
uh, for their water. It's, it's detrimental uh, to them and to your grazing areas. They're going to stay closer to that area where the water is uh, during our hot summer months, and they're going to graze that area uh, down to a point where we don't want them to and may not utilize other areas of your pasture. So we have to strategically place that pond in the right location where those livestock don't have to, uh, to travel great distances to get to that water source. If the pond water is going to be utilized elsewhere for irrigation, uh, maybe fire protection, we need to locate the pond again as close to the major water uh, source as possible. Uh, conveying water, uh, you know, pumping water uh, over a great distance is expensive. Uh, so in other words, if we have a fruit orchard or a pecan orchard that we're going to utilize our pond water uh, for irrigation purposes, we need to try to locate that orchard as close to the pond as we possibly can. That way we don't have to convey that water a great distance. And that will alleviate some of the excessive cost in doing that. We want to avoid pollution of pond water by selecting locations where the drainage is not going to cause a problem for the pond. In other words, if you are close to uh, uh, possibly a livestock feedlot or livestock corrals or sewage lines, uh, dumps, crop fields, anything like this where you're going to have some things that might be washing into the pond uh, that you don't want, uh, we tr try to avoid those areas, those runoff areas, uh, where that won't be a problem for us once we get our pond constructed. We want to also check to see if there's any underground pipelines or cables across a proposed pond site. Uh, so we need to check on those things ahead of time. If you determine uh, a, a, a possible site for your pond, uh, you need to check with the necess necessary uh, companies or entities uh, that might possibly have, uh, again, cables or pipelines, power lines, underground power lines, and so on. Uh, check on all those things before you, uh, you start digging. For ponds where the surface runoff is the main source of the water, the contributing drainage area must be large enough to maintain water in the pond during droughts. So that's another consideration that we have to take into account. Uh, we want to put those in an area where they will receive some uh, runoff water uh, to keep that pond full for most of the year if possible. Uh, so that all comes into play. Uh, but again, we don't want to select an area where it's going to cause, uh, you know, we're going to catch so much runoff that it's going to go around the spillways of your pond and possibly um, go over on your neighbor. We want to avoid those situations, but yet we need to have area adequacy of the drainage. Pond depth. Uh, we want to ensure that a permanent that we have a permanent water supply. We go through several months here in the summertime here in North Texas uh, where we don't get rainfall. Uh, so we need to try to possibly get that pond uh, at a depth that we're going to ensure that we have water in that pond for most, most of the year if we can uh, and that it never goes dry. Now we run into some problems here in areas of North Texas. Uh, here in Collin County we have a particular problem because we have in a lot of areas a layer of, of white shale, uh, caliche rock, uh, that may be up fairly close to the, uh, uh, to the soil surface. Uh, so we have to, again, take that into account. Look at different soil, or look at a soil survey, and you could obtain those through the uh, USDA Natural Resources and Conservation Service or online. There are areas to find that information to see what the depth of the soil is and whether in fact there is a layer of that um, white shale under your property. Uh, that does limit us sometimes as to the depth that we can uh, uh, dig upon, uh, but it's, it, it is crucial, so you need to, to take that into consideration. Uh, it may be that uh, it might be an area on your place where you can't get down uh, to, to that depth that is needed to keep that pond 
with water in it throughout the year. But, uh, you know, sometimes we have to do that. We have to build what we call wet weather ponds where, you know, they may stay or have water in them for uh, several months out of the year, but maybe not all of the months. But we have to take that into consideration also. Drainage area protection, uh, to maintain the required depth and capacity of a pond, the inflow must be reasonably free of silt uh, from an eroding watershed. So again, we have to take that into consideration. Um, mentioned earlier about crop fields. A lot of times we get uh, silt from those fields because there are certain times out of the year that the farmer will plow those fields, uh, disc those fields to pre prepare them for the next crop that he's going to plant there. And when we get these uh, huge downpour rains, then we can get a silting into the pond. So again, we have to, uh, site selection is so crucial uh, in, in these ponds, in constructing these ponds. Uh, drainage area protection. There are some things that we can do uh, to ensure that we can slow down uh, that uh, uh, runoff process, whether it be silting into the pond or, again, whether it's in, as a situation where we have um, drainage from, from livestock pens or from crop fields or so on, we can somewhat uh, protect that situation um, by cert utilizing certain conservation practices such as terraces, uh, conservation tillage, and a lot of our farmers in North Texas utilize that particular practice uh, now uh, where they don't uh, plow as much as they used to uh, use minimal tillage or even no-till. Uh, strip cropping, um, conservation cropping systems, planting um, what we call uh, buffer, buffer crops that will, and, and that's certain grasses that will help slow down again uh, and catch some of those runoff things, the silt, uh, possible herbicides, uh, uh, fertilizers, uh, livestock waste, and so on, and keep them from, uh, from entering the pond. Uh, pond capacity, um, estimating pond capacity, uh, it, we can do this. Uh, there's a calculation that we can use here. Um, a simple method, and I have it listed here, is we need to establish the normal pond full water elevation and stake the water line at this elevation, measure the width of the valley at this elevation at regular intervals, and use these measurements to compute the pond full surface area in acres. Then we multiply the surface area by 0.4 times the maximum water depth in feet measured at the dam. And below there, I have an example uh, uh, of this calculation and how you can calculate uh, the surface area uh, of your pond. Now we, we'll go to aquatic vegetation. Won't dwell on this a whole lot, but we do get uh, many questions through our office on uh, aquatic vegetation identification and then the control. Now there are three, basically three categories of aquatic vegetation and those are submerged plants, those plants that grow on the surface, and then those plants that grow above the surface of the water. There are different methods of control also once we identify uh, the aquatic vegetation that we have in our ponds and that is mechanical. That's actually uh, going out there and removing it uh, uh, with such things as rakes, um, uh, different types of equipment where we can uh, mechanically uh, remove some of that aquatic vegetation. Then there's biological control, actually utilizing uh, fish, certain fish species uh, that work well to uh, uh, control. Primarily it will be either surface or submerged plants. And then our last resort is, is chemical control. And we do have uh, some really good chemicals that are out there that help us control uh, some of these aquatic vegetation problems. A really good uh, website to go to uh, to help identify uh, the aquatic plants that you do have in your pond and also those different methods of control that we spoke of and it's simply aquaplant.tamu.edu. It's a really good source. It has some really good color photos of different types of aquatic vegetation so I would suggest that you go uh, to this website to determine uh, some of those plants that you have in your pond and then what might be the best course of action for you to take 
in controlling those. Again, on the uh, vegetation identification, um, uh, basically, again, we have the algae uh, that, that is basically a floating uh, plant. Uh, we have several different varieties of, of submerged uh, aquatic vegetation. And again, we have those that grow above the surface or along the shoreline, uh, such as cattails and bulrushes and those types of plants. Again, the method of control, we look at me mechanical, biological, and chemical. Uh, and chemical being the last resort. Okay, next to uh, uh, stocking fish in our ponds. Once we get that pond constructed and we get it full of water, um, then we want to determine if it's for recreational purposes or maybe for controlling the aquatic vegetation. We look at uh, different fish species that we might want to, uh, to put into that pond. And basically, we can categorize these fish also. We have predator fish. Have those listed there, largemouth bass, uh, smallmouth bass, uh, crappie, uh, sand bass, catfish, and there are several different uh, species of catfish. Uh, Channel and blue have two of those listed here. And then we have bait fish, uh, listed just three here, but there are several different um, species of bait fish. Uh, sunfish, bluegill, uh, fathead minnows just being three of those. Now, one thing we need to discuss on, on these fish is that uh, the smallmouth bass uh, really don't work well for our area. They really prefer uh, areas where, where the water temperature stays a little bit cooler uh, than one, what most of our farm, farm ponds would be during the summer months. Uh, crappie is also not a good selection uh, for a farm pond. Uh, they can uh, overstock in a pond very quickly. They are a good uh, uh, fish species and, and my favorite fish to eat actually, but uh, uh, if you put those in a pond, they can overpopulate very quickly and you start catching fish that are very small, uh, paper thin, uh, really not a good choice. Um, sand bass is really also not another good selection for a uh, farm pond. They do better in lake situations. Uh, the catfish are. Uh, channel catfish is probably a better choice uh, than the blue catfish. And really as far as, as uh, uh, fish go here in North Texas, if we're putting fish in there for recreational fishing purposes, it's going to be the largemouth bass uh, or uh, catfish, channel catfish. Um, you can mix those two. We normally don't recommend that. You choose one or the other. Um, and the reason being that uh, uh, the bass uh, are, are more prevalent uh, as far as being a predator. Uh, they will also overpopulate a pond too, so we have to keep a really close check on those largemouth bass. Uh, again, the bait fish, a lot of people like to feed their fish uh, with the uh, supplemental uh, fish foods that we can get at farm and ranch stores uh, today. But uh, really a, a better choice is to stock your pond with, with uh, a bait fish. Uh, the, the red ear sunfish is a good one. Bluegill is another really good one. Uh, and put those in there and let those predator fish, uh, the, the largemouth bass or the channel catfish, uh, feed on those fish rather than uh, feeding them a fish food. Have some pictures here um, just to give you an idea, and, and many of you are probably very familiar here, but this is a, a slide picture of a largemouth bass, uh, one of the uh, probably most prevalent um, uh, recreational fish uh, here in North Texas. This is the channel catfish, and this is probably the second most popular uh, here in North Texas. Um, one thing about the catfish, a lot of people uh, will call and say my pond stays muddy most of the year. If you have catfish in there, uh, it probably is going to stay rather murky throughout the year, but they're a really good fish to eat and, and to a lot of fun to catch. A uh, really good choice for a, a pond here in North Texas. This is a picture of the crappie. Again, this is the one that talked about uh, that is probably not a good choice for a for a farm pond. Uh, they will overpopulate, but uh, uh, really good fish in lakes, um, in streams, and uh, really good eating fish too. And then this is the bluegill. Uh, bluegills are also really great for recreational fishing, but they're one of the uh, uh, really good ones to stock in as far as a, a bait fish or a forage fish. 
And then this is the red ear sunfish, another excellent choice for a bait fish or forage fish. Uh, mentioned earlier about the utilization of um, fish as biological control uh, for aquatic vegetation. This is a picture, uh, an example of one of those. This is the triploid grass carp. Uh, you can obtain these fish, uh, put them in your pond. Now they're only going to control the submerged vegetation. Uh, a lot of our different mosses that grow in the pond, they will not do a whole lot for the algae that floats on the surface. Uh, but they will do a good job on, on things such as uh, uh, coontail, uh, southern naiad, uh, bushy pondweed, some of those things. Uh, and you can see here, picture, these fish get rather large. Uh, they are a hybrid, so they do not reproduce in the pond. You do have to fill out an application uh, through Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. So if you're thinking about um, uh, stocking the triploid grass carp as a biological control for aquatic vegetation in your pond, uh, you need to go to the Texas Parks and Wildlife website, um, print off that application, fill it in, send it to them, uh, and then you can call a fish hatchery to uh, obtain your, your triploid grass carp. Uh, for the algae, and I don't have a picture here, but uh, tilapia are a, a good choice uh, for uh, biological control for the algae. They will eat the algae that floats on the surface. The only problem with tilapia is that sometimes they have a difficult time surviving our winters here. The water temperature gets a little bit too cold for them. And <clears throat> sometimes you can get it, excuse me, a die-off uh, of, of those tilapia, and sometimes you have to restock each spring uh, when the water temps warm up if you're going to use them as biological control uh, for algae. Uh, here is the Texas Parks and Wildlife website uh, for the information on the triploid grass carp. Again, the application is on that website. Uh, there's also a list of the different fish hatcheries in Texas as well as neighboring states uh, that are on that website, and many of those uh, will provide those triploid grass carp or the other fish species that we spoke of in the presentation today. I know that we've, uh, we've covered this uh, presentation rather quickly, uh, just covering three aspects, the pond design, aquatic vegetation, and fish species. Uh, this last slide has questions on it. Know that this, this is an online presentation and we don't have the capability uh, to answer uh, questions, uh, but uh, I would entertain that you uh, give us a call at our office at 972-548-4233. If you do have specific questions about pond management, or you can uh, check our website at colin.agrilife.org, or shoot us an email. Uh, my email address is r-maxwell at tamu.edu, and we'll try to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, hope that you've enjoyed this presentation. Again, we will be posting a presentation weekly uh, for our uh, spring online ag production series so we welcome that uh, welcome you to go to our website uh, that's where you can locate these presentations click on educational events and uh, you should be able to uh, pull those up our our soil testing presentation from last week is still there as well as a youtube video of of greg and i uh, as an introduction to the course and how to proceed through the course uh, so anyway thank you for uh, uh watching the presentation. I hope it's been helpful and we will uh, have another one up for you again next week.